All right, welcome back. This is Brian with Radical Prep. We're doing number 21. Uh, this one says, for which value of x is the expression x plus 2 over 2x minus 1 undefined? And I'm sure you guys heard, if you want to figure out if any expression is undefined, just set the denominator equal to 0. So it's that easy. So we're just going to write 2x minus 1 equals 0, and we're going to solve. And you can do this in your head, I'm sure, really fast. I just like writing things down, so I feel like as a teacher, you can kind of see what I do in my head. And we get x equals 1 half. So uh, that's choice 4. And if you plug that in, 2 times a half is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So we don't want the denominator, we don't want the denominator equaling 0. That's going to make it choice number 4. All right, let's move down to the next one. We got number 22. Uh, last year, Nick rode his bicycle a total of 8,000 miles to the nearest yard. Nick rode an average of how many yards per day? So they give us this chart and they tell us that uh, one mile is 1,760 yards. So if I do 8,000 miles, it's going to be a ton of yards. So I'm going to multiply. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do, um, if I did 8,000 miles, so 8,000, okay, times... 1760 that's going to give me the total amount of yards and it's going to be a huge number I'll just do it on the calculator real quick uh, 8,000 times 1760 okay so we have 1408 um, with four zeros one two three four and that monstrous number is 14 million yards 14 million 80,000 yards yards so now, that was the total amount that he did, and they want to know how many per day. Well, we're just going to take that massive number, and we're going to divide it by 365 to give us per day. Okay? So when we do that, divide it by 365. Now, look at your answer choices here. Can you kind of guess which one it's probably going to be? It's either going to be 3 or 4, right? But we divide by 365, and we get 38,000, 38,000. 575. Choice 4. All right. That's it. Let's move on to the next one. Um, which one or which set of these integers is not closed? All right, I'll be honest. I, I didn't look at this beforehand, so I'm forgetting what closed means, but I think I have an idea. You know, I don't know the math technical way of explaining it, but Basically what I would say is this, if you do 3 times 3, you get 9. And you're always going to get an integer when you do multiplication, right? You do, you know, negative 2 times 4, you get negative 8. So with multiplication, you're always going to get an integer back if you start with integers. Remember, we're starting with the set of integers. Addition, well, 3 plus 4 equals 7. 7 plus 21 equals 28. So no matter what addition, you're always going to get integers. Same thing with subtraction. Now the one we have the question mark is division, right? Because what happens if I do 4 divided by 2? That's great. We get an integer. But what happens if we do 4 divided by 3? Do I get an integer? No, I get 1.333, you know, going on forever. So division, when you're in the set of integers doesn't always give you an integer back so that's why you gotta pick division for this one um, meaning all of these other processes you can do and get an integer back but we showed here if you use integers and divide you don't always get an integer back okay let's go on to the next one so a model rocket is launched into the air from ground level the height and feet is modeled by p of x equals negative 16 x squared plus uh, 32x squared, or excuse me, negative 16x squared plus 32x, where x is the number of elapsed seconds. What is the total number of seconds the model rocket will be in the air? So before I go and solve this one, I want you to think about what the graph is going to look like and what the graph actually means. If you had a graph of this, oops, come on pen, work. Let's try that again. If you had a graph of this, um, and it looks something like this, this is a negative uh, exponent or a negative um, quadratic. So it's not going to be smiling. It's going to be looking something like this, right? 
So ignoring what the equation is, if this is the path of the rocket going up in the air, it's at sea level or it's at zero height when it first takes off, when this is when the person launches the rocket, so it's flying through the air, and it's also at zero height when it lands, and these are your roots. So basically we're trying to figure out, what does it want to know? What is the total number of seconds uh, the model rocket will be in the air? So we want to know when does it hit the ground again, right? So we want to know, that's the elapsed time there, when it hits the ground again there. So we want the height to actually be zero. So we're looking for that height to be zero. So we want P of X to be zero. They put P of X here, but they told us it's the same thing as height, right? So we know what height to equal zero. So all we're going to do to do that is we're going to write an equation and, and plug in zero for P of X and solve. So zero equals negative 16 X squared plus 32 X. We'll move this over, add 16x squared, add 16x squared to both sides. All right, so I'll just move this over a little bit. 16x squared equals 32x. Divide by 16, divide by 16. x squared equals 32x. Okay. Um, Oh, what did I do here? That's why. Sorry. 32 divided by 16 is not 32. It's 2. Sorry. Um, divide by x. Divide both sides by x. And we get x equals 2. Okay? x equals 2. So again, we're just looking for they want to know the total number of seconds that will be in the air. So that's basically after the flight is done. So after it's flown, its height's going to be zero. So since we know the height's going to be zero, we plug it into that one side there, the P of X, and we just solve. Okay. All right, let's move down. 25. All right, looks like another gigantic flower. The old gigantic flower question. All right. The diagram below shows the path of a bird. The, shows the path a bird flies from the top of a 9.5 foot tall sunflower to a point on the ground five feet from the base of the flower. So that's this distance over here. It went from here all the way down there. Okay. Oh, let me move this out a little bit. I'm sorry. I just realized that you guys can't see everything. Okay. Um, to the nearest tenth of a degree, what is the measure of angle X? Well, again, you got to know Sokotoa, so this is your trigonometry stuff. So I'll write it again. So, ka, toa. Now, can you figure out which one you have to use? We look at the angle. Here's opposite. How do we know it's the opposite one? We make believe we're shining a light. It actually, it looks like the sun. So if the sun's shining, which wall does it hit? It's that one. That's the opposite. This is the hypotenuse, because it's always opposite the 90 degree angle. So that means this is the adjacent. So the question is, which one do we have to use? Opposite and adjacent? Opposite and adjacent. That's tangent. So the tangent, this is how you write it on your paper. The tangent of x equals, or the tangent of some angle equals 5, 5 over 9.5. So what you're actually going to do is, when you go to use your calculator, you can't hit tangent, you're going to hit, I'll just tell you, I forget how they write it on uh, in class. They might write tan x to the negative one. I'll be honest, I can't remember how they write this. But on the calculator, you're just hitting the second button, second, tan of x. And then you're going to input uh, 5 over 9.5. So I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but I'll just do it here on my calculator second tan and that's going to be 5 divided by 9.5 I don't know if you're able to see this here second tan uh, 5 over 9.5 would hit equal so it's basically you're asking the calculator to find the angle whose tangent is 5 over 9.5 whatever that equals and when you do that you get 27.8 that's choice one okay 
So practice getting good at the uh, labeling your triangles and knowing which side is which. It's, it's not that bad once you practice it. Okay, number 26. Uh, let me zoom back in. Which set of numbers represents the length of a side of a right triangle? Well, here's a nice little trick. Right triangles, the two that I know for the SAT that they usually test and are good to know, are the 3, 4, 5, and the 5, 12, 13. So right off the bat, um, this is the, the 10, 12, 14 one. They're trying to trick you because really if you have a, uh, where is it? A 5, 12, 13, that means you also have a 10, 24, 26. I'm just doubling the sides. So that's not one of them. 3, 4, 5, you can also have a 6, 8, 10. I'm just doubling the sides. Okay, and if you times it by 3, you get 9, 12, 15. So this isn't one of them. And you could test this out, the 14, 16, 18. So if you wanted to, you could draw a right triangle. And you could do um, a squared plus b squared equals c squared and do the whole equation. I'm just going to save you the time and tell you that the 7, 24, 25 is also a uh, Pythagorean triple. So you remember I told you earlier there's the 3, 4, 5. There's the 5, 12, 13. And then there's the 7, 24, 25. And if you do it out, 7 squared plus 24 squared does give you 25 squared. Okay. Um, let's go to 27. How many different seven letter arrangements of the letters in the word hexagon can be made if each letter is only used once? So I, I like these questions, actually. I think they're kind of interesting. So the way you're going to solve these, you're, you're going to put spots down on the piece of paper. Hexagon has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spots. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you don't know what letter you're going to put in the first spot, right? But you have seven letters to choose from. So that's seven. Now, when you go to pick a letter for the second spot, you don't have seven letters to pick from because you already picked one. So you have six. Same thing's true when you go to this spot now, you only have five letters. So you can see the pattern keeps going. And this should look like, if you haven't learned it in school, this is called 7 factorial, or the exclamation point, which just means 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3, blah, 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 on and on. So I haven't used this calculator in a while. Um, let's see, 7 times 6 times 5 times, oop, 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 50, 40, 5,040. So it looks like, what does that mean? How many different seven letter arrangements? So if you mixed up all these letters and tried to make different, you know, nonsense words, you'd have 5,040 words that you can make up. Okay? And that is choice four. All right. Moving on. We've got three students each rolled a wooden cube with faces painted red, white, and blue. The color of the top face is recorded each time the cube is rolled. The table below shows the results. So student one rolls a cube 30 times, and these are the results. He gets 11 red, 7 white, 12 blue. Um, it seems like he rolls it more times, he gets more blue. They roll it less times, they get less blue. What I'm concerned about is, I want to know, well, let's see. If a fourth student rolls the cube 75 times, based on the experimental data, approximately how many times can the cube be expected to land with the blue on top? So we want to know the chances of us rolling the cube and getting blue. So I'm going to use the data that they already gave us to figure out, well, what were the, what were the chances that it happened already? So for student number one, they rolled it a total of 30 times, but he got blue 12 times. So that's 12 out of 30. Now for the second guy he got 20 out of 50 and for the third guy he got 8 out of 20. Now if this die is consistent all those numbers should give us the same variable or the same variable the same value. So what is 12 out of 30? Is 0.4. 
So you got a 40% chance of this happening. That's 0.4. What's 20 out of 50? That one you might be able to see right away. That's 0.4. So blue has a 40% chance of popping up. 0.4. And we'll just do it for just so we see it. This one's 40%. So blue always has a 40% chance of popping up. How do we use that to our advantage? Well, the same way I did this. We don't know how many times blue is going to pop up, but we know we rolled it 75 times from our problem, right? What is that going to have to be equal to? Well, what did we just figure out over here? What is blue always equal to? What are the chances always equal to? 40% or 0.4. So now this is a pretty easy problem. I just put this over 1 and I cross multiply. So 75 times 0.4 gives me 30. So x equals 30. Choice 2. And you're done. That's it. So this was how many times blue shows up, the total rolls, and the chances. We're going to set it equal to the chances, which we found before was 40%. All right, number 29 says Dominic graphs the equation y equals a times the absolute value of x, where a is a positive integer. If Gina multiplies a by negative 3, the new graph will become... All right, so I'll be honest. I don't remember if you guys get to bring a TI, one of those graphing calculators on your test. If you can, you can play around with this and just kind of figure out what happens. But um, basically, I'll start here. Um, y equals the absolute value of x. We should know what that looks like. That's just the graph. And you get that typical v, right? Because that's y equals x going that way. And normally, it would go down in the negative direction but since it's the absolute value everything's above the x-axis right there's the x-axis there's the y-axis so there's your graph of y equals x so now what happens when you do something like y equals 2 times the absolute value of x what happens to the graph well we can kind of figure that out really quickly if you don't know all we have to do is so here if we had our t-chart x y and you have when x is 1, y is 1, when x is 2, y is 2, 3, 3, right? Because it's just y equals x. When you do a t-chart for this one, what happens when x is 1? Well, when x is 1, 1 times 2, so now your y value is 2. When x is 2, 2 times 2 is 4. When x is 3, 2 times 3 is 6. So now, at 1, this is going to be higher up this one's going to be higher up when it gets to 2. It's going to be a 4. So when you multiply by a number greater than 1, or an integer, I should say, an integer, not a fraction, your graph gets more narrow. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what this is. We know that Gina is multiplying by 3, or negative 3. So the 3 will make it narrow. Now let's figure out what the negative does. So now, let's say we did y equals negative 3 times x. What do you think the negative is, negative is going to do? Well, let me just do this. We know it's not going to be wider, so we'll get rid of those two right away. So now we can do our t-chart really quick. And again, if you've got a TI calculator, you probably can zip through this. This is a nice way to think about the problem, though, um, if you didn't have that. So we'll do 1, 2, 3 again. When x is 1, What's the y value? 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. When x is 2, what's the y value? 2 times negative 3. So it looks like um, that's negative 6. And 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. So now look what happens. At 1, that's going to be negative 3. At 2, negative 6. And so on. So that's doing that. What do you think it's going to do in the opposite direction? Well, we can just test out. Well, we know at 0, it's going to be 0. At negative 1, negative 1, the absolute value is 1 times negative 3. So at negative 1, this is still negative. So this is going to do this. So basically, long story short, when you multiply by a negative, it flips the graph. OK? Um, when you multiply by an integer, it makes the rate of change 
it, it increases the rate of change faster. So you, your, your graph is actually growing quicker. That's why it gets more narrow. If you multiply by a fraction, that's when it widens. So fractions make it widen and, and coefficients or integers make the graph grow faster. So you're looking for something that is narrow and opens down. All right. All right, the last one for the part one here is number 30. It says Mr. Supi, or Mr. S Supe, I don't know how to say that, recorded the height in inches of each student in his class. The results are recorded in the table below. So we got this giant table of heights, and they're asking us how they organize it. And they're telling us it actually says which cumulative frequency histogram represents the data. So I'll give you a little hint. If it's cumulative frequency, it adds up the values from the previous categories. So all the uh, graphs should be going up. The second you see cumulative, you got to pick a graph where all the things are going up. Okay, so because of that, here's what's going to happen. This one, number one, and this one, number two, are gone. They're both wrong right off the bat. Okay, so um, let's figure out here. Let me do this. Let me minimize this a little bit. And let me do that. Okay. So we got to figure out if it's we're up to these other choices here. This is gone, and we said this one's gone because they don't increase. So we got to figure out is it number three, or is it number four? So the way we're going to figure that out is we're actually going to look at the graph here and look at our values and see which one makes sense. So in the 55 to 59 range, this one's saying there's only one value. There's only one person who has a height in that range, and this graph says from 55 to 59 there's two people. So we're going to do this as fast as possible. We just got to figure out how many people are in that range, right? So let's just go to our boxes here and let's figure it out. Okay, so there's 159. There's one person. And I go around, oh, 58. There's two people. Well, right off the bat, it can't be this one. Because in the 55 to 59 range, the frequency or the amount of things or, or heights that are in that range is two. So it's not going to be that one. Now, how would you know to get rid of these? Well, let's say we went to the 55 to, to 64 range, right? Well, in that range, you have one, two, the two we had from before, three, four, um, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, that one makes sense too because in the 55 to 64 range there's eight remember I said the categories have to be getting bigger because it's cumulative it adds the ones from before okay so that's your answer alright I hope this was helpful for you guys for the part one let me know if you got any questions